Yes. Fantastic. So I'd like to welcome people here today for the uh, webinar on exploring retrofit models, opportunities for community energy. Um, uh, it's really great to have so many people here and from great, uh, great different backgrounds and expertise. So it, we certainly don't have all the knowledge. So it'd be great for people to chat, share experiences, share links to things that you're doing, events and what have you. Um, as we go on, yeah, please use the chat for that sort of thing. If you have specific questions uh, for us to answer, uh, please put them in the Q&A and we'll come to them at the end of the session. Just a little bit about how the session will run. Um, although, because Nadia's not here yet, I might need to reframe this slightly. So uh, there'll be a brief introduction about community energy from myself. Then um, I think I'll talk about retrofit in the able to peer sector. Then Nadia will talk about low income sector. Well, then a little bit uh, of a promo for PPR, people powered retrofit and Q&A, and we'll close at two o'clock. Uh, as I said, we're recording the session and all slides will be made available. Um, so yeah. What is energy efficiency? I mean, uh, maybe I should have asked what is community energy? Um, just briefly, community energy are uh, not-for-profit organizations locally based, uh, predominantly uh, motivated by uh, tackling climate change through clean energy generation. Uh, that's a lot of the focus of community energy groups, but increasingly energy efficiency is part of that mix. Um, and, um, there's the state of the sector report from Community Energy England, Scotland and Wales, uh, which is a fascinating report and do ch check it out on their website. Uh, but as you can see, of the 400 odd organisations that they uh, identified, um, 50 of them were, in that, were involved in some kind of um, uh, low, low carbon heat and 132 in some kind of energy efficiency uh, work. So, you know, talking about a third maybe of groups there. And what kind of things do we mean? There's a, there's a variety of different roles that um, community energy take on there. Um, um, it's all around energy saving, I should say, and it, like reducing demand, uh, insulation, could be around individual homeowners, um, uh, homeowners or tenants or, or residents. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today, but sometimes it's community buildings. Um, here you can see the range of different things people are involved with, web-based engagement, workshops, energy switching, which I'm not sure I'd call energy efficiency, but anyway, uh, insulation, so around a quarter get involved in what you might call traditional energy efficiency, energy assessments around 30% audits, um, and then going up to things like lighting, obviously a lot easier to engage with. And so the focus of what we're gonna be talking about today is gonna to be more around that insulation interventions retrofit some questions so i've got a series of polls to run which hopefully right okay i will launch this so first of all i'm interested in where are people from uh, what's your background and you can tick multiple things here so are you a householder community energy organization local authority a practitioner a campaigner you know it may be that you're all of those things and that's totally fine uh, but let me know I would give it a few seconds uh, for people to input. Okay, a few more, nearly everyone's there. Fantastic, great. I'll end the poll there and share the results and hopefully you can see that. So around 64% of people are householders. So there's a lot of, well, obviously in some shape or form we're all householders um but yeah uh, people here as householders we also have community energy organizations you know, around half people practitioners in the sector campaigners and a few local authorities that's useful to know because um often local authorities are very interested but not so many people from local authorities today okay next poll what's your level of retrofit expertise so uh, do you know absolutely nothing about retrofit and you're just starting out? Are you a beginner, intermediate, an expert? And don't be shy if you are an expert. I've, I've seen on the call there are a good few experts here. So, yeah. Okay, brilliant. 90% of people there responding. So we have a lot of intermediate knowledge 
and expertise. Ah, Nadia's joining us now. Fantastic. Uh, quite a few inter people with intermediate level of knowledge, quite a few experts, a few beginners, a few no people know nothing at all, and that's totally fine. So we'll focus probably a bit more on the more intermediary stuff, but we'll try and keep it accessible for everyone. Last question. Now, if you are from a community energy group, um, and um, and uh, obviously about half people are, have you carried out any retrofit activity to date? Um, and if you have, what have you done? So a few people may have not, but advice and information, assessments, let's say audits, home energy checks as part of that, recommended contractors, done retrofit offers, have you actually procured works on a small scale or even deep retrofit? Give you a bit of time for that. And hi, Nadia, do you want to say hello? Thank you for making it. <laughs> you can, I'll ask you to mute. Hi, Jonathan. Can you hi guys there. Hear me? Yes, fantastic. Thank you very much. We've just done a series of polls about where people are from and the level of expertise. OK, I'm going to end this poll. This is the final poll. So, you know, a good few people have not done stuff in this area. Um, and the majority of people have done things. It's mostly advice and information. It's quite a few home assessments uh, and not, you know, insignificant number of kind of people procured works, but a small number of people have done the whole house stuff. And that's totally fine. Uh, great. Stop sharing that. Fantastic. Well, that gives a really good impression about who's in who's in the virtual room and people's knowledge. So it's community energy is a big focus, intermediate levels of knowledge and people looking to go a bit further, I can see. Okay, Nadia, do you want to do your presentation now? Are you able to do your presentation now? Uh, I'm actually just sending the slides over to you. So if you wouldn't mind going first, um, and okay. I'll get them over to you and then go after you. Right, fair enough, cool. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is a bit about Carbon Corp's retrofit journey, uh, where we've come from and where we've gone with People Powered Retrofit. And I think here's an, a good uh, good opportunity to see the kind of journey we've been on, which has been starting out relatively uh, kind of simple interventions and advice and then going through. And hopefully that kind of journey illustrates um, some of the things to put in place to develop that far. Okay, just a little bit about our approach to retrofit. Again, I'm not going to get too technical because obviously different levels of knowledge, um, but um, our focus is energy efficiency improvements. That's, that's our definition of retrofit, but it also small scale renewables and smart systems. Um, but our focus is fabric first. So we're focusing on the fabric of the property first, doing that insulation work first and building towards these these other things like renewables and, and systems and heat pumps and what have you, um, getting the demand down primarily. We take a whole house approach. So that's multiple measures applied together. It doesn't necessarily mean that we do everything in one go. It might mean that we do or that we advocate a stepwise approach to retrofit, but that we have a whole house plan in mind. So people are working towards something. Um, we favour low impact materials and uh, whole life cycle sustainability. You know, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there, but embedded energy is certainly part of um, our thinking and avoiding, you know, putting too many heavy metals and minerals into a, into a house. And we also focus on an open source approach. We license our, our software in an open source software license. Um, we're also a part of, uh, well, Past 2035, we're part of the technical uh, board that oversees that, and we also harmonise the work that we're doing within that, that quality process. Carbon Corp, when we start out, it's all about householders taking action on climate change, and people join Carbon Co-op um, to gain access to uh, technical knowledge and expertise, to projects and finance offers, uh, gain knowledge and, and um, around like contractors and the right sort of people to work with. Um, but fundamentally, it's to create a group of like-minded individuals all working towards the same kind of aims, which are around tackling climate change in our homes and communities. And our focus since the start has been on um, large interventions, significant interventions um, of the size and kind of magnitude that are needed to tackle climate change. Um, so 
it's all great that people are focusing on smaller stuff you know that's not to be poo pooed at all but what we see ourselves as trying to get out there and to do be almost like a vanguardist thing to demonstrate what is possible and push people's ambition I uh, should say we've been going for 10 years now we actually have quite a staff team now we're 21 people um, and we do retrofit but also energy systems work and energy advocacy as well so all kinds of things yeah it gives you an idea of the scale so engaging the able to pay market um, and yeah we re I really want to make the point that just because we're focusing our work on able to pay doesn't mean that we think only only people who can afford to should should be able to access a retrofit there are other markets and other mechanisms and other models for working with people who aren't able to pay or in different tenures of housing we also fundamentally believe that those who aren't able to pay the state needs to act in that context and needs to redistribute resources and that's there's only so much that we can do as an organization we do operate in in other parts in in a field poverty context as well and my colleague anika has launched a retrofit for all report recently and um, so that's from a social justice point of view we're not just focused on the rich having said that we do believe that people who uh, are more responsible for the issue of climate change who generate more of the emissions generally live in larger houses and have larger fuel bills should pay their way and should take more responsibility than those who aren't able to pay so there is there is a kind of rationale for focusing on this market I'm going to talk about some of the simple things that we did early doors to gain the kind of uh, experience and reputation in this area. We started off with just eco home tours. Uh, we had a big red bus. Sadly, it's gone to the bus depot in the sky now, uh, but it was a great way to engage people. We went round eco homes in, in Manchester, uh, took people round. People got to meet the householders, understand their experiences, understand how they retrofitted their homes. And I know a lot of people have been engaged with this, but it was a, a great way to kind of like get a toehold. We also ran a series of socials. Um, these are an opportunity for peer learning and knowledge exchange, um, where we brought in people who are real advocates, who had particular expertise in some area or another. And this, again, was a great way to kind of position ourselves and to build our reputation in this area. We also have a range of knowledge sharing and awareness raising tools, uh, videos, manuals. We have a, a really well used online community. I know Carla is on the call today and maybe a few other CalmCorp members, uh, Lloyd as well, who uses, uses this. And it's actually become a really great way to share knowledge and expertise. Um, and it all this all kind of builds into a social marketing approach um this is part of the uh work we've done around people powered retrofit which we'll talk about in a sec but essentially building these engagement mechanisms and i know some people say oh you know there are, there's a limit to these kind of things they're all need to be grant funded and they don't go anywhere but actually these are fantastic social marketing um, um, approaches that build awareness and build a client base in an area of knowledgeable expert people who are really interested in this sort of thing and want to go to the next stage. So, yeah, they might seem fluffy, but they're actually really elemental parts of, of generating a market, we believe. And this is a quote it's actually from Carla. So that kind of stuff that we've been doing, without a doubt, our carbon court membership has proven to be the most beneficial investment we've made in our home. We're constantly able to keep up to date on all things retrofit in the forum and through shared experience with other active and supportive members. And we're well informed on what's available to us. And our knowledge has definitely saved us money. So yeah, there's that stuff. I want to focus going forward on finding value. And the first thing that we did around like value a service that we were able to offer was home retrofit planner assessments, initially called My Home Energy Planner. We've been running these since 2012 now. So it's, it's nine years and we charge out for this service. It's a two hour visit from a home energy assessor. They come to the home. We have a tool that we've built, a web tool that sits underneath the assessments. Uh, we deliver three scenarios. These are costed scenarios for work people can have on their own homes. Um, it creates a report. The report is then given to the householder for consideration. This is like a real foundational part of someone's retrofit journey. And 
over the years, we've done more than uh, 250 assessments, and we've got a huge waiting list at the moment for more. We're, we're able to sell these at £500 per assessment. Um, well, sorry, initially they were 450, they're 500, now they start at 550 and they go up to 1,000 when people have complex houses that need lots of, lots of modeling work. So this for us is a fantastic income generator. It's finding a value that householders want. This is knowledge and information. They find it very hard to find elsewhere. It's the modeling tool that sits behind it and the expertise of the assessor to recommend sets of measures. Um, we're starting to replicate this with other community energy groups but very slowly because the focus is on quality and making sure that it's a quality assessment done, done with others. Um, what more can I say about this? I think this, this, this thing took us on to the next stage of people powered retrofit, which I'll talk about now. So at the stage we started people powered retrofit, we found that we'd helped a lot of people get assessments and we generated money and that was great, but people were finding difficulty moving on from assessment down to the other stages of retrofit that helped them get their actual retrofit done. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the stages of people powered retrofit and the different elements that I think are useful for community energy groups to build together, to build a retrofit service for the owner occupiers. So yeah, people powered retrofit, this is our very focused, owner occupier able to pay end-to-end -end service from advice through to works and we've been running for a pilot stage for three years and we're now launching this as an independent uh, community benefit society first of all it's really important to understand why retrofits not happening and talk to the householders there why they're not able to procure retrofits that they that they want and we found we've done a lot of research in this area and we found that whilst householders were quite motivated and we didn't find a problem finding the householders, um, they actually also had finance in place, especially the early adopters that we were engaged with. They had problems. A lot of it was around confidence. Um, we did a lot of work about the risks of retrofit. It actually made people think twice about whether they wanted to do it. Um, they also found conflicting advice out there, um, different people telling them different things. Um, there are all the other things uh, that people talk about around finding right the contractors with the right kind of uh, skills and ensuring quality works. Um, but a lot of the things were around, I'm not sure what decisions to make. I've got so many decisions, I don't know what to do for the best and really needing a kind of hand holding. And that's one of the one of the motivations behind people power direction bit. The first stage of this, and, and we, we, we went really complex here. We did a, we did a mapping process. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through all these maps and what they mean. I'm just demonstrating like the level of detail we went into uh, around mapping Greater Manchester, retrofit, the awareness of retrofit, and different aspects of the communities in which people live to better understand where people more likely to procure retrofit lived. We did a lot of mapping. You don't need to do loads and loads of mapping, but it is about understanding your area, not trying to treat it as one size fits all and everyone's the same. Understand and target resources towards specific areas that are more likely to have these people who are, who are likely to retrofit um, and live in those areas. I think we found a lot of a lot around that, around knowledge about um, what types of areas people are likely to live in. We also looked at the personas as well, um, and we developed a set of personas here with Loughborough University. Different people, different motivators, pragmatists who are just interested in retrofitting their homes. Yeah, it's around climate change. Idealists who want to go to the nth degree. They want to they go as far as they can around retrofit. And also civic-minded retirees, people slightly older, um, who want to do right by their communities. You know, climate change is a bit of it, but there are other motivators in there as well. So um, developing the mapping and the personas, I think is quite fundamental to helping understand these areas. We're working with several local authorities to do this kind of work now to enable retrofit, um, community energy groups to retrofit. But I, I think it's really important. Also supply chain. Um, 
now there are many and different kind of roles again you know i'm not necessarily trying to uh, communicate all the different aspects to this what i want to uh, communicate here is that there are many different roles involved in retrofit many different competencies and it's not just about finding a builder there are lots of different different kind of competencies around this um and it's important if you're developing a retrofit kind of project in your area to understand that to map what's out there again and to where possible to support the development of this sector again it's a tough ask for uh, community energy on its own but it, this is an area where local authorities are wanting to do more community energy groups can be a good partner for for local authorities so we've developed bits of training um, to help people on the way and we've also developed a network of retrofit contractors again not only for us to kind of procure into but also to help them work together um, to support each other um, i think we need to have respect for people that are already in the supply chain sometimes people say oh contractors can't handle it actually there's a lot of good people out there there's a lot of rmi refurbishment maintenance and improvement people out there that we can already work with and skill up the training needs to be practical and peer learning is is really valued learning between contractors and there's a job there to demonstrate good good clients to those contractors um it's not just about um saying there's work there and people just jump for it you know because you know there are a lot of challenges around retrofit for contractors service design as well it's about thinking about what the service is. We talked about value earlier. You want to deliver value for householders. How does that service stack up? What does it look like? We did a lot of design here around uh, consumer journeys and blueprints and how that looks. It's really important to fit this to the capacity of your organization. And some of the groups we're talking to at the moment, it's about understanding the value that you can offer and like how you do that within a service. This is our kind of end-to-end -end service advice, the assessment, the design development, on-site support, procurement, help with procurement, and then handover and coordination. And there are different people involved at different stages here. Again, you know, I'm not going to go into this too much detail, but it's to show that a job of work is needed to kind of develop and design that 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 journey. And there are a number of different skills involved with here, a number of different practitioners. Uh, we have advisors, service manager, product manager, training manager to work with the with the supply chain, retrofit coordinators, retrofit assessors. We're actually combining that into a role called retrofit surveyor. We also work with architects, engineers, contractors. Now, I think real challenge here is how do you get this expertise into a community energy organisation, but ultimately to be able to offer the value, you need the expertise, and that might be a stepwise process, but in terms of people powered retrofit most of these people aside from the contractors are on our staff team you know so that's we're able to then generate the income charge out for the services build our, our capacity okay i'm 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 um, rounding up now just some lessons if you know for other people looking to do this sort of thing Fundamental for me, I think, as an organization, agree your ambition, you know, what you're trying to achieve. Um, you may want to go to kind of become really expert. You may just want to be advice oriented. That's fine. Just understand where you're at. Understand people, the people, the clients you want to work with. What are their motivations? What are their barriers? What are their needs? Test and pilot things out. Um, start small you know there's no point spending years designing something beautiful that doesn't work when it hits the real world start small but start identify value it's really really important that we can quantify the value that we can offer to householders and that we can offer that we have the expertise building the technical expertise and the capacity having that in-house for us is absolutely essential to being able to create that value get trading as soon as possible because the trading aspect even if it's small amounts is demonstrating there is demand and and it's helping you build income and build expertise and capacity and be open partner and collaborate there are organizations such as ourselves um retrofit works um there are cse you know lots of people out there um, who are interested in collaboration so reach out and work with us and together we can do some really great stuff and last thing for me, community share issue, 
we have a community share issue going for people powered retrofit um i'd really appreciate if people put the word out um about this um the link there to fx is there download the business plan because we have loads and loads of knowledge and information to share with people it'll be it's how we're doing it but hopefully that'll be useful to others we'd really hope that some community energy groups consider investing in us um investing reserves if that's an option and you can sign up for more information so thank you very much that's my whistle stop tour and i will hand over to nadja but i believe i need to download your presentation so i'll do that now do you want to just um introduce yourself nadia i don't know whether you're able to share your your um yeah i would love your to camera. um i think i think the video video sharing is off uh, maybe you can change that oh yes settings. of course yes. Right. yeah so um just to get started that was really really interesting jonathan <laughs> um and it's really interesting for me to hear because i think our diff our project is similar in some ways but very very different in a lot of ways um so yeah um, future fit homes webinar two there we go that's the one um so yeah i am nadia i'm from southeast london community energy and sorry you're having to watch me on a phone today <laughs> it's been a bit of a hectic day with some technical problems with my laptop. Um, so thanks, Jonathan, and thanks everyone for bearing with me. Um, but if you can't hear me, do let me know and I'll sort something out. Um, so we have two programs that I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Uh, the first one is an able to pay program. Uh, and the second one is strictly for clients in fuel poverty. And Jonathan really wanted me to talk about our work with people who are on low income. And when I say low income, um, this applies to our able to pay clients somewhat, but it also uh, obviously clearly applies to our, our fuel poor clients. So the two programs that I'm going to talk to you about are Future Fit Homes, which is the able to pay one, and then um, our eco work uh, for, for fuel poverty. So uh, yeah, if you go ahead onto the next slide, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, so just a bit of background about me. I um, joined Celsi about a year and a half ago now. Um, I've come from a renewable energy background. I uh, have worked uh, a little bit in buildings and in uh, especially policy uh, around the future home standard and, and retrofitting buildings. So I'm not a technical person, <laughs> not a technical expert by any means, which um, uh, I would say Jonathan is so a lot more than me, um, but managing the projects, you learn a lot and we've learned a whole lot this year, which is, which is what I wanted to share with everyone. So uh, next slide, please, Jonathan. So just a little bit about Celsi. We were set up uh, about seven years ago now by a group of local residents in Greenwich and Lewisham boroughs in Southeast London. Southeast London, funnily enough, now everyone thinks of London obviously as being, you know, very expensive and um, having very high earners. Um, to some extent, that's true, definitely true that it's very expensive. Um, but South East London actually has one of the worst rates of fuel poverty uh, across Europe. So there's a huge amount of need for, for support for people living in fuel poverty and a huge amount of old housing stock that needs to be retrofitted. Um, our main area of business was really solar to start off with, uh, alongside the fuel poverty. And our intent was that the solar would fund the fuel poverty alleviation work. Uh, practically in London, it really doesn't work that way because the solar sites just aren't lucrative enough. Um, they're very small. Uh, the costs are higher in London to install solar. So we've had to find other ways. Um, but a lot of that is down to the huge number of volunteers that, that put in hours for us. Next slide, please, Jonathan. So just to kick off with the Future Fit Homes programme, which is the programme that I run. Um, Future Fit Homes was launched uh, just over a year ago now. It went through a phase of feasibility studies. And um, that was funded through the London Community Energy Fund. And we were funded for um, a very small amount, about 
£14,000, uh, essentially to do research and check if this, if this concept really would be feasible. Thankfully, we found that it is feasible, so we went ahead and got started. Um, and now it is running to some extent um, without funding, although it is yet. Um, and it's very much running without funding because our staff members are employed um, and paid for through other means. So the aim of it really is um, to create a, glee, a, greener, a glee, greener and cleaner London. Um, you can see on the left is one of our leaflets. So that is kind of how we market the, the service. And uh, we employed, we employ trained um, domestic energy advisors, retrofit assessors, retrofit coordinators. Um, obviously some of those have been within our team have been, have been trained whilst we've been going through the program. Um, and these people are the ones who are at the forefront of everything. Um, they, you know, they're amazingly great technical people and, you know, geeks about uh, energy and about energy efficiency. But they're also, I think one of our strengths is that they're just so good at talking to people and they're so good at understanding what people's concerns are and being, you know, personable and being able to explain things really simply, which um, Jonathan touched on this, you know, understanding what people need. And a lot of it is addressing people's just apprehensiveness and concerns about retrofit. Um, we're also members of the Retrofit Works Cooperative. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but supply chain is one of the really tough issues in the retrofit industry. Um, we are members of Retrofit Works Cooperative because we uh, wanted to be part of an initiative which was supporting um, installers to, to do this work to a high standard, so past 2030, past 2035 uh, level. Um, and because it's really one of the only ways that we can get to a network of installers at the minute, um, we find it very hard to sort of be in touch with and access local installers who are happy and willing and qualified to do this work otherwise. Um, and the final thing about the Future Fit Homes programme really is that the, um, sorry, bear with me one sec, uh, is that the aim of uh, this really is to generate income for our community work to fund our fuel poverty work. Uh, we think it will be sort of at least three to five years before it does start generating an income that is viable and, and usable. But we really want to get to the point one day where we don't have to constantly apply for grant funding all the time. And I think a lot of people have that goal, um, but, but that's one of the reasons that we wanted to set up an able to pay program. Uh, next slide, please, Jonathan. Here you go. Thank you. So we have a number of uh, services. Sorry, I need to, I should have edited this slide. It's not coming soon. These services are up and running now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we um, offer all clients a free half hour call to start off with. What that helps us do uh, is um, figure out exactly what route the client is going to take. Uh, because we have two different routes that we can take them on depending on what their budget is and it helps us also uh, gain some credibility with the client because clients really are not sure what you're going to offer um, if they haven't engaged with you before they don't really know if you're qualified to talk in this area and most importantly if you're trustworthy uh, when they deal with builders when they deal with contractors a lot of the issue is they just don't trust the advice that they're giving because builders and contractors have sort of a vested interest in doing what's easier for them and what's cheaper for them. Um, so that the free, free phone call really helps with um, just getting people sort of into the net and getting them ready to actually open up and have this conversation about their home, which is a very personal thing to them and they, they really care about it a lot. Um, Home energy audits and whole house plans. We really wanted to do this ourselves, uh, but we haven't been able to do this ourselves. And I will tell you the reasons why in a little bit. Um, 
what we have done instead is we are working with Ecoferb, who are a project set up by um, uh, an organization called Parity Projects, very, very close partnership with Retrofit Works. And they support the sort of end-to-end -end management of people who are um, doing large-scale retrofit projects over £10,000 budget. Um, so, so they do the whole house plan and they do the energy audit, but our retrofit coordinators are employed through them. So the client goes through them, but it's essentially our retrofit coordinators that go and do that, go and do that work. Um, we also offer one-to-one -one hourly advice. Um, and this is really where the services split out between the different types of clients. So we've got the, what I would say, very able to pay clients uh, who um, have that over £10,000 budget and go through the Ecofurb route. We've also got the able to pay, but not able to pay so much clients. So we see a lot of clients that are on, um, you know, middle to low incomes that do want to invest in retrofitting their homes, but they really don't have um, large sums of money to do that. And this is where the hourly advice comes in. It's charged 60 pounds an hour. It can be done over the phone or video call or in person. And it's a really good option for people that want some more information, but want to do things themselves to keep the costs low. Uh, a few other services we offer are thermal imaging surveys. Uh, we were trained by the Cheese Project, who most of you will have heard of to do them. Super popular, would highly recommend um, you getting in touch with them. Uh, that is probably our most popular service at the minute. Um, energy performance certificates, we also do uh, just because our team are qualified to do them, although we actually haven't had too much uptake of energy performance certificates. And of course, retrofit coordination. Uh, retrofit coordination, again, is done through our partnership with Ecoferb. So our personnel are employed through Ecoferb to, to take that off their hands, essentially. Um, but that's all done under the Ecofer brand. Our, our clients um, sort of deal with us, but um, yeah, ha go through Ecofer for that work. So again, we would love to be able to do this in-house like Carbon Coal for doing, but we just don't have the systems in place at the minute. We don't have the funding to put those systems in place and it's a huge job. So well done to Carbon Coal. I don't even know where we would start on doing this. Um, okay, next slide, please, Jonathan. There you go. Thank you. So the main thing I wanted to talk about today was our fuel poverty alleviation work. But I really wanted to get the message across that it's not just people that qualify for fuel poverty support that are on low incomes. There's a huge demographic of people on low incomes who are able to pay a little bit and who need um, support in retrofit but don't have huge budgets to spend on retrofit. That's probably most of the clients we deal with actually. Uh, but in terms of our, our fuel poverty alleviation work, so the kinds of people that we're able to deal with in, in this stream of the work are people that are in receipt of benefits, um, people that uh, in some cases pass a sort of minimum, uh, maximum income threshold um, and have a lot of dependents uh, that rely on them. Um, so we're working with a partnership currently of 12 uh, local authorities in South London. It's called the SLEEP Partnership, which I think is an absolutely terrible acronym, mm -hmm. but um, our industry is full of terrible acronyms. Um, and what we do through this is we really bunch together all the bits of funding that we can actually find to do a retrofit for a client. Um, so we have supported over 996 vulnerable households um, in the past year. Uh, that advice has been from sort of just advising them on energy bills and how to switch and how to, um, uh, you know, take small measures at home to actually small measures, um, I'm talking about giving them radiator reflectors, um, you know, tap aerators and things like that. But um, we also help them apply for and have installed large measures as well where we can, but it's really tough to do this at the minute. 
in terms of large measures, I'm talking more, you, see, you know, external and internal wall insulation, cavity insulation, loft insulation, bits like that. Um, next slide, please, Jonathan. There you go. Thank you. So one of the main um, mechanisms that we that we use for this, um, I think there's something wrong with the screen zooming in. Maybe it's just me. Can everyone else see the, the full slide or is it? We can okay, see great. a quick eco primer and then four boxes. Got it. Yeah, it's back to normal now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, one of the mainstreams of, of funding that we use to support clients in fuel poverty are, is um, eco funding or energy companies obligation funding. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this uh, because it's very technical. But if your local authority has not undertaken the eco flex um, allowances, which they can elect to do if they, you know, if they wish to, um, then please encourage them to. That means it will widen the eligibility criteria uh, for people that can access eco funding. And EcoFlex is pretty much the only way we get any work done through eco. Um, next slide, please, Jonathan. There you go. How much time? Um, yeah, I was just going to say a couple of minutes. We've got a lot of questions. <laughs> sure. Um, so it's uh, it seems to have zoomed in again to your slides. I'm not I sure think it's if... just your thing because it looks oh, fine. I think here, yeah. No worries. Um, so really, the the reason that our fuel poverty project has worked so well. And I say that it's worked so well because over, look, over the past year and a half, um, we've managed to go from employing three members of staff on this, not full time, part time, and having a tiny office to now employing around 11 members of staff who are mostly full time and moving to a much bigger office and be, being able to serve so many more people. Um, but the benefit or the reason it's worked so well is because we work in collaboration with our local authorities um, and they are absolutely the main support line for this work. Um, it's, it's also hugely beneficial that we have the sleep partnership in Southeast London uh, because that enables us to use a, um, a referral system through other organizations that are dealing with vulnerable clients. Um, and that really helps us both bring clients in, but it also helps us in terms of actually managing the referrals, doing all the background um, stuff, all the CRMs and, and all of that stuff. Um, so in, yeah, since 2017, we've managed to support 320 clients uh, through the process of, of uh, getting some work done through ECO. Um, we essentially make money on this because we are funded somewhat by the local authority to deliver energy advice, but that doesn't fund the measures. Um, ECO funds the measures, and then we're also funded by the contractors uh, through a finder's fee. And the contractors are the ones who actually um, sort of receive the money through ECO, but uh, we get paid a finder's fee, which I uh, believe is a few hundred pounds for each client, uh, dependent on what, um, what, dependent on if they're eligible to get the work done. Um, and that's sort of what, what keeps us going on, on uh, the ECO work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I, I had a case study. I don't think I'm going to go through this. You guys can have a read through this as, um, as we, as I talk about it, but the reason I wanted to attach this case study is we deal with hugely vulnerable people. We deal with people that not only have problems with their home and with their energy, but they have lots of other problems. They have mental health problems. Some of them are in situations where they're, um, being abused. They have um, financial problems in terms of debt, um, a ton of uh, issues. We deal with a lot of uh, refugees who are having issues in terms of their um, citizenships and, and documentation. 
etc cetera, etc cetera, work so a really important aspect of our project is that we refer them to other services that can support them and we get referrals through other services so if you're going to do this work make sure you build your local network with other organizations that are dealing with vulnerable clients um, next slide please jonathan um, this is just a quick case study we actually <laughs> supported the local mayor to get some um, eco-funded work. Believe it or not, the, the local mayor at the time was uh, eligible for eco because he um, was on an income threshold uh, or he was below the, the maximum income threshold um, considering how many children he had and how many dependents he had. So yeah, people that you don't expect to be on low income may well be on low income. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that for this slide. And next one, please, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so, oh, sorry, there we go. The funder's fee is £100 per client. Um, it's just important for us to highlight, this is a really tough place to work in. It's a tough, it's a tough market to be in. It's a constant struggle to find funding. It's a constant struggle to um, find contractors that will do the work and give you the finder's fee. It is a constant struggle of um, administration and, and reporting requirements to different funders, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not easy to get into, but it's extremely rewarding work and it has a really big social impact. And I think that is the uh, last slide. So three steps to get started with the retrofit. Um, one, you're already doing the right thing. Talk to other organizations that are doing retrofit. We have learned the most just by talking to other community energy groups. Two, get some systems in place. Retrofit, you're gonna be dealing with a huge number of individual clients. So you need to have CRM systems. You need to have um, uh, yeah, internal IT systems in place that are gonna help you manage all of this work. Three, get to know your clients, get to know your community, get to know the organizations that um, you can work with and that are working in this space uh, because your network is the most important thing when you're dealing with um, community energy in general, but especially uh, something as personal as, as people's homes. And a bonus point, think about supply chain. Um, it's a tough one. Jonathan touched on this uh, more than I will need to, but um, yeah, to take it into consideration and uh, hopefully we can all work together to find some solutions on that. But yeah, thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, Nadia. Virtual clap. Um, right. We have lots of questions. So let me see if I can multitask and um, got three for you to go for then, Nadia. So, uh, oh, I think you've basically answered this one. The Selkie get um, any kind of commission or share fees of the work done by retrofit coordinators. You've discussed that, haven't you? Yeah, so we get the referral fee for the eco work, which is £100 per client. And um, the retrofit coordinators for the able to pay work, uh, we also um, get paid a percentage of the project or the work that's been done yeah. by eco club. And you've set out the kind of situation there. Um, uh, Kate asks, are you using Ecofurb because of insurance and liability indemnity or capacity and expertise or both? <laughs> yeah, both. Really good question. Um, both. More so because of capacity, I would say, because Ecofurb have access to a piece of software called Chrome Software, which um, we have looked into, but it's it's too expensive for us to be able to invest in. That's one of the main reasons. But the other reason is yes, indemnity, and um, we're not sure how to navigate the landscape of, uh, you know, getting contractors in, and if the contractor goes wrong and, and does something badly, we're not we're not there yet. So yeah. yeah, both. Cool. And then final one for you in this round: What extra does EcoFlex give compared to Eco? Asked Johnny Stokold. Mm. Um, I'm going to have to ask Giovanna the answer to that, but <laughs> I believe that um, eco is dependent on clients uh, be, being on certain uh, benefits. 
um, and it doesn't go any broader than that. I think it's also restricted to the type of properties um, that the clients are in. So it has to be solid wall. Um, it has to be have a certain type of heating system, but I'm not sure what that is for, for the eco core group. For the eco flex, there's a minimum uh, or a maximum income criteria, but the maximum income is not fixed. It's based on how many dependents there are in the home uh, and things like that. So if it's, you know, a father earning 20,000 um, and a mother earning, you know, 15,000 working part time, but they've got, you know, seven kids, they're not they're not very well off. So yeah. Ecoflex will allow for that. Cool. I'll answer three questions and then maybe one or two more. Um, Digby asked, what data did we map to understand personas and did we pay for it? And we actually used a lot of open data. There's a fantastic amount of energy data available at a local authority, city, regional and national level, bears, and it increasingly it's kind of there for people to use. We also augmented that with our own research that we carried out, simply going to householders, um, people that are within our network, surveying them. Obviously, these are the interested people, but that's part of the part of the challenge. You know, you want to access them. them. Um, and so, yeah, we built up a lot of information ourselves for very low cost. Tom asked about branding and marketing consultation. I mean, was it expensive? He says, was it a good investment? We didn't spend a lot of money doing that uh, because I think the idea behind social marketing, which is around sharing expertise, peer learning, um, uh, doing webinars like this and what have you is positioning yourself as an expert in the sector and um, yes there's some branding behind that but compared to traditional forms of marketing it's a lot cheaper to go at and then Daniel asks and he's got a couple of questions around the PPR we talk about social franchising and replication what does that look like and I think there's a real challenge here for the sector around what franchising and replication looks like um, and I did a really good course which I'd really advocate for people at the School of Social Entrepreneurs which is all about social replication but essentially it's about codifying the model that we use our service We've created a, a manual, which is our, our kind of how-to guide, and then, and then packaging the software tools behind it. And we indeed do, do license that in an open source. You know, our, our um, assessment methodology is open source. Um, and then we replicate that with others. There's an upfront cost and then an ongoing cost. Um, and we're testing that replication in three different areas of the UK at the moment, in Cumbria and Devon and, and an extent in Bristol with, the, with our assessment tool. Uh, what I would say is like we shouldn't, expectations shouldn't be too high that we can just like throw something out the door and everyone can do it. This is like a high value service that requires capacity and knowledge and expertise to deliver. Also, you know, we're at a point where we've just we just finished our piloting phase and now we're operating commercially. So we shouldn't run too far too fast and try and get everyone to adopt the same kind of things. As like uh, Nadia discussed, there's kind of um, retrofit works out there. There's Cheese as well. They're looking to do um, um, a franchise service as well. So there's lots of different people in this area doing stuff. So it's kind of uh, waiting and seeing but there are you know there are uh, models out there and the more we go on the more readily available they will be and yeah I mean um, Daniel says you know is there a strong case for national open source software absolutely and you know that's something we're doing but also integrating into the past 2035 universe like there needs to be more work at, um, Bayes level Trustmark level to create open data standards that everyone can work towards because retrofit is a sector ripe for being revolutionized in the way that octopus revolutionized energy supply uh, the, the software tools chris and moira asks basically it's a um, it's an energy modeling software tool that people add elements to and we've got a library element to it libraries of measures that people can and add and what have you sorry skimmed over that but um, there's a lot of information on our share issue page i'll share the link now um, question for you, um, Nadia, um, are you finding funding is restricting the measures that you can install and if installers are only willing to install, install certain energy saving message, uh, measures? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a nightmare. <laughs> so uh, talk to us about that, how so? 
So the first problem is in the restriction of what kinds of uh, clients can access what kinds of funding. Um, a lot of our time is spent interviewing clients and finding out all the details about their income and about their homes to understand actually what you know what schemes are they eligible for and it's completely different amongst completely different funders so you know if you've got gas central heating you're cut out of lots of schemes um if you uh if you're uh, an elderly person you're you've got a lot more schemes open to you if you're on certain um uh, benefits you've got a lot more schemes open to you um, if you live in a property with solid walls uh, you've got a lot more schemes open to you and, and we can understand why that is the case but with the case with a lot of the funding schemes it's incredibly hard to actually find houses that have all of the criteria that they're asking for um, and yeah again I couldn't give you details on exactly what that criteria is that would that would be a question that I'd have to get back to you guys on um, but um in terms of yes the measures that we install uh again that's completely restricted by the funding um i'll give you an example on my own home um i've had some support in applying for eco funding um, we have got central heating uh, but we've got a boiler that doesn't work and it's it's um it was a lot of information that we had to give about our income and about the, the people living in the in the property and um, one of the only reasons we were actually eligible was because my um, grandma had uh, because of how old she was and, and the medical issue that she had and until now two years later we haven't had anything installed because they can't figure out exactly what they're able to install and what they're interested to install and this is the installers yeah. and um, if they can if they can process the funding application to get that installed. So they've yeah. come back and they've looked at a, a heat pump and a boiler combination. Yes, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> we've had a similar yeah. thing in, in one of the, the um, Green Homes Grant local area schemes here as well. It's quite concerning. We're gonna have to wrap it up. Thank you, Nadia, so much for joining us. I have posted a Jamboard link in the chat um, so I would really like people to go and visit that. And let's just show you. Basically, we'd love your feedback because it helps us improve the session, improve what we do for others. I'm just going to share it now. Hopefully you can see this. So the Jamboard is a really simple thing. There are good things and there are bad things about today's session. Please go to the left hand side, the sticky note, click on it. This was good click save and it appears on the Jamboard and you can just maneuver it under good things. If it's a good thing and a bad thing, if it was a bad thing, you can use the little pen here to create a stroke on the uh, line from one to 10. And that just overall, how was the seminar? One to 10, good or bad. And if you have any interesting things you wanna recommend, do this, do this next time. Click on there, cancel and put it under here. So yeah, so it'd be fantastic. It's a fantastic way for us to learn and improve and do better with our, our things. And I'll leave this Jamboard going for the next 15, 20 minutes. So yeah, please please um, add comments, positive, negative. We really need to hear improve, improve uh, for future sessions. Massive thanks to Nadia. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna Thank share the, both me. the presentations and the recording. They'll be out really soon uh, into your inbox. So thank you again for coming. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us, Nadia, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Thanks, everyone, Bye. for joining. Cheers. Bye.